Hello everyone, I am H05 and welcome to the first C++ Intermediate Lecture. If you have any questions, you can ask them in the live stream chat or in the Discord server. So, let's get started with our lecture. First of all, I'm going to talk a bit about undefined behavior in C++. So, undefined behavior is some kind of error, you could say, that you can make if you're not paying attention. So, let me give you a few examples so you can understand it better. If you try to divide by zero, for example, int a equals 3 and b equals 0. If you try to do a divided by b, this will run an exception. As you can see, exited with floating point exception. Um, another way to, another example would be to try to get the value of an undeclared uh, variable. For example, int a, if you try to, do, to get the value of a, if that is itself a, it will most probably output a random number or zero, depends on the compiler. Here you can see the output is zero, but it's not always but this is not always the case. Um, another example would be if we, if you have an array, let's say an array of integers, with the three integers, array equals with zero, one and two. If you try to access, for example, um, stdc out if you try to access area of 7 for example or let's do area of 3 because this is a common mistake um, it, er, area of 3 is outside the boundaries of the array and sometimes it will output 0 sometimes it will pop out to a random number for example area of 5 it will, out, will output uh, let's see 0 again but as I said this depends on the Compiler. And another example would be an integer overflow or underflow. For example, if you, if you try to store a large number, let's say 1 trillion, 1 million, 1 billion, and 1 trillion, and this um, 1 trillion is too large to be stored in an integer like data type, so it will output a random number. As you can see, one, one warning and minus seven to seven three seven nine nine six eight. So to sum it up, an undefined behavior is when your program doesn't know what to do and it just outputs something that is in memory. So if there are any questions, I, I hope I made myself understood. But if there are any questions, ask, feel free to ask them. Now we are. I'm going to go a bit on. C style arrays. So, what are C style arrays? Uh, C style arrays are basically the pr the primitive type of array in C and C++. They are they are declared they are initialized and declared and initialized like this. For example, int array uh, of six, and this will create an array with six elements. But and we can do this zero, one, two, four, and five, and we can access its elements as well as like in the same way we access the elements of a normal array. So if we did C out air, array of 3 or, or of 4, will give me 4, as you can see. And this is the same thing as declaring std array of int and 6 array. This is the exact, the exact same thing. However, it is preferred to use a CD array because it's a bit easier to work with. So, yeah. <laughs> now, one difference between them is that, for example, if you have a constant int integer, int n equals with 4, you can do int c array of n, and you can do std array of int and n uh, array. And this will work fine, as you can see. However, if you try to, if n is not a constant in, in the integer, if you try to do, for example, in x and std c in x, for example, now you, you can declare an array in c array two, let's say of x. This will work. So here we input, um, let's say four. And it works. However, we we cannot declare a std array like this. std array int and x 
array to this leaf run exception. Uh, as you can see, not here. Uh, so this is the way that C arrays work. They are also called C style arrays. It's the same thing. As I said before, it is preferred to use std array and std vector if you want, if you have to. std array and and std vector. So on a similar topic, I'm going to talk about C style strings. So C style strings are basically their C style arrays of characters. So if you have a char and s. And we can set this as to be an array, and we can say, for example, hello. So this is a C style string, and an array of characters, and it, it has a few different functionalities than the classic C, C style array, because, so, for, it has a few functions that I'm going to go over in a bit, and it is, with them, you, you can output them, just using this out and the name of the array like this so as you can see output the whole array and line and what I recommend is to not write here a value of characters not to go one two uh, one two three four five and write in here five because are, it's not necessary, and you are probably going to mess up something because, for example, if you, if you write in here 5, I'm pretty sure that it's going to give an error, even if there are 5 characters in here. Yeah, and as you can see, because the idea is you have to put one character more. So basically, hello has H E L L O, and at the end, consider that there's another character, for example. I mean, it's written like this, you know, it's basically, it's, not, it's a null character that says that the string ends there, and you're probably going to forget about this most of the time. So, yeah, remember that there are the number of characters that you write plus one. So, if I run this, it should work perfectly fine. Now, there are a few functions with the, the C strings. They are all defined in the C string header, so include the the C string and we have for example we can declare another array char t and we are not going to give it a value just yet so we are just going to put six in here as well and we can use um std str copy like this and we write t and s the idea is it is like to copy the S string into the T string. So now we can just write this list out T. And you will see that it copied the D string into T. And remember T has to have at least as many elements as S has. So if S has six, T has to have six or more. So I can do equals to, I mean I can do it equals to, but it's not going to work. So, yeah, basically 6, or you can put 7 in here, or even more, but 6 is the minimum. But another function that we have is strlen, so that basically gives you the length of the string. So, for example, strlen of s, this should give us 6 as well. Oh, oh yes, it gives five because there are five characters. I forgot. Yeah, and the sixth character is not considered to be inside the string. And there, are, there are more functions that that you can find them in. Um, if you Google C string, you see there are some copying functions, concatenation, comparison, search others, and you can basically just click on them and see, for example, mancopy and just look up whatever it says here. And you can find examples. So, if you are interested in seeing some more of this function, make sure to check out the class or CGP reference or something like that. So, yeah, usually you want the C string. But the idea is C has strings, so like it has a C string, and in general you should use them instead of the string. So, yeah, and uh, yeah. 
now we, we are going to, to get a different topic the topic of um, the size this is going to be a small topic we are going to talk about the size of the data types that are in, in C++ so each data type like an integer, a char or a boolean or anything else char, bool, etc um, it has a size in, in bytes so one, for example int is 4 bytes uh, char is one byte, bool is one byte. On, on most computers, not in all of them, but on most of them, these are the sizes. And you can see the size of a variable using the size of op operator. So in the size of int, for example, it should give four because on my on my computer the int is four four bytes. And if it, it could give two on other computers, letters. Um, test the CL size of char, for example, will give me one byte. So, like this one. Then you can you can use this for arrays as well. So let's make an std array. Second, this the array of in integers and three elements array, and the size of this array will be four times three, so twelve bytes, or it should be twelve bytes. Size of array. Yeah, this gives twelve twelve bytes. So and and this is useful. This will be useful for the next topic that I'm going to cover. But before that, I want to, to mention something related to hexadecimal numbers. So you know hexade hexadecimal numbers have 16 uh, digits from 0 all the way to 9 and then A, B, C, D, F, D, E, F. So these are the digits that are in hexadecimal. And a number written in hexadecimal, for example, 4, 5, F, 2, this number will have a 0x at the start. So this is a hexadecimal number. And I'm saying this now because it will be useful in, in a moment. So just remember this. So now I'm going to cover the topic of pointers. And first of all, I'm going to start with memory addresses. So what is a memory address? A memory address is basically the address of a variable that's stored on the computer's memory. So each variable, for example, if I create int a equals 3, this value will be stored somewhere. And the place where that value is stored is called its address. So I can see, for example, one second, because that requires some problems. Okay, great. So stdc out. I can so this is the value in A, and now this will be the address. The address once, and we get the address by writing this and uh, ampersand and A. This gives the address of the A variable. So we see the address is a hexadecimal number, it starts with 0x and it goes with a few numbers. And the idea is that this address is not always going to be the same one. So here you have this, this memory address, but when I run the program again, I'm going to see that it, it may change. Sometimes it changes, sometimes it doesn't. So right now you can see this one is at the end 74dc. And the next time it will have 7b8c, so it is clearly changing. <laughs> so this is something that you have to remember about memory addresses, that you access them with the ampersand sign and that they are not always the same. And now I, I will talk a bit, a bit about how you can store this memory address, because it doesn't really help just to know it. You, have, you, could, you can store it somewhere. And you can store it in a variable of, type, of a type pointer. So for example, I can create int, and this with this asterisk here will signify that it is a point. It is a pointer to an int, to an integer. So I can do p equals and the memory address of a. 
So now I can do SECL E. And this will give me the same thing here. So these two addresses are the same one. There is the original pointer. And you can do something that's called you can dereference the pointer. So you can do um, one second. You can put asterisk and the name of the pointer. Then that. And this will, will get a value that is stored at that memory address. So as you can see, we dereference the pointers and we get the value stored there that is free. And the address that is this number. And this is really useful because a lot of times in C++ you want to you, you basically want to want to know where the variable is stored and and how you can use it and stuff like that. So and just re remember this for now. Now I'm going to also show you something else that is uh, with C style arrays. If you have a C style array, let's say array of four. This array is actually a pointer, like the array itself. So if you, you can do as this C out uh, array, this is a pointer to the start of the array. So pointer here, and this is the same as one second. Is the same of, as a pointer to array of zero. So one second, a pointer. The array of zero. As you can see, these two values are the same because this is the same. And the idea is that you can store, you, you can, for example, do something called point one second, um, a pointer to an array to pointer decay. So if you have a, if this is a pointer, array is a pointer, and you can have another pointer, let's say PA equals with array. This this works because there are two pointers. However, now if you, this is only a pointer to an integer, it is not a pointer to, an, to an, the start of an array. It's just so if if you try to do this see how size of array and then size of PA One second. So this will give you the size of the whole array, which will be four times four because it's an integer. So it will give sixteen, while this should give four or eight, depends on one. Let's see what yeah, it gives sixteen, and this one being a pointer, it, it is eight because pointers use eight eight, eight bytes on most computers. So yeah, this is no longer an array. PA is no, is no longer a pointer. Point. So you have to remember that. And now I'm going to talk a bit about pointer arithmetics. So what does that mean? You, you can do a, a mathematical operations on pointers. For example, let's delete all of this for now. And you can have, for example, an array, an array of Six and let's say one, two, three, four, five, six. And we, we can have a pointer to let's say area of two. So we can have int a pointer equals with a memory address of a of two. So this is the memory this stores the memory address of three of area of two basically. So if this is how if we dare it. If we dereference it, it's using the asterisk, we will see that it will output free, as you can see. And what you can do now is instead of dereferencing only p, you can dereference, uh, for example, p plus 1. And what will p plus 1 do? It, this will increment p to point to the next element in the array. So instead of pointing to three, points to the next one, points to four. You can, if you do p plus three, it will increment from three to one, two, and three. It will point to six. And 
this this is the same for minus so you can subtract let's say p minus 2 we'll point to minus 1 and minus 2 we'll, we'll, we'll point to area of 0 so as you can see 1 here and why does this happen and what does it mean it means that when you subtract a number from a pointer you basically subtract that number of uh, bytes the, that number of bytes of two bytes multiplied by the number of bytes that the pointer points the wait um, you basically subtract so if you subtract two times let me just write my comment um, you subtract two times an integer uh, uses four bytes so two times four basically so you should subtract 8 bytes from here. So you go minus 4 bytes and minus another 4 bytes. And this is what minus, that minus 2 does. Because if you want, there, there will be a link in the lecture notes pointing the, uh, a link to a, some a question on Stack Overflow that explains this pretty well and why does this happen. So, yes, and what you can also do is you can increment and decrement the pointer. So P and now SDCR. D reference P, it will point again to 4. And NLP is pointing to 4. And what you can see, or maybe we do something right now, so SDC out P, and now if I do P plus 2, or P plus equals with 2, so this is the same as D equals with P plus 2, by the way. Um, now if I do SDC out P, you you will see this this will point this will be eight and then it will increment with eight and in hexadecimal eight plus eight is sixteen so it's basically ten like one zero so the output up. and um, we try to decrement it by one and SDC out P. This will output uh, this minus 4. So this is equal with this plus 8, and this is equal with this minus 4. Because, as I said, an integer is 4 bytes. So it, it may be a little bit uh, complicated to understand at first, but uh, if, if you have any questions, you can ask them, and hopefully, somebody will be able to answer. Um, if you want to take a look at I have one second. You can read this for a bit. So basically, when when you perform pointer arithmetic on a pointer, that points to a data type called P. Um, for example, an integer, a char, whatever. Uh, then you, you increment it by, by x. So for example, by two, you, you increment it by two. The pointer's value will be incremented by x times the size of Oops, the size of P I had to write here, sorry. So basically, to x, one second, if the pointer is equal, is incremented with x plus size of P, basically. This is what happens, but you don't really have to remember this necessarily, you just have to know that that, that you can do this and remember it <laughs> and so I, I hope this made sense I, I don't know if I can explain it the best way but uh, I can give another example for example like if we have a, a char array character array and we call it s so s just s equals with array s of 3 equals with, because you can do this as well, equals with s, f, g. Now let me get, get rid of this for now. Okay. So this will give, now if I do a, um, a pointer, char, and a pointer, let's say, W equals with S. 
so this will point to s of 0 so into this character and now you can do s d c out you can dereference s and you can also dereference s plus 2 and this will point to the first and then to the first plus 1 plus 2 so the first and to the third element so as you will be able to see s and g so I hope this made sense. As I said, if you have any questions, ask us in the live stream chat or in the Discord server. Now I, I will jump uh, to another topic related to pointers, that is dynamic memory allocation. So, dynamic memory allocation. And what does this mean? Well, this means that you can allocate memory like instead of letting the compiler do it. For example, if you have an, if you have an integer, here yeah, the compiler allocates the memory and then it deallocates it when the main function ends. You, you can do that yourself using in something called the heap. So you can basically store variables on the stack or on the heap. It are stack and heap. And what do they mean? Well, when you declare a variable like this, in a equals free for, for example, declare it on the stack. And what what is the stack? The stack is basically a place in memory where you can access the the value the, the values pretty fast and it doesn't take much time. But however it has data memory, it has something like a few megabytes if I'm mistaken. And the variables on, on the stack for fall out of scope when the scope ends. So for example if I have here a scope you can do one second. If you not, uh, so we have here a scope that is determined by the parentheses, by the accolades. We have int d equals with 3. Here we can do sdc of d. d. However, here b does not exist anymore. Here b falls out of scope, basically. And now if you try to do here SDC out B, this will be from error because as you can see use of un of undeclared identifier B. So B does not exist here anymore. However, you have the heap now. And the heap you declare a variable on the heap using the new keyword. So you, you can do basically declare a pointer to that variable. So you can declare int and pointer, let's say, x equals with new int. What does this do? This creates a pointer to an integer variable on the heap. So now you can do, you can dereference x and say that its value is equal with 5. And then you can do sdc out x, basically. As, as you can see, it works. And so this library is stored on the heap. So if, for example, this whole thing is in a is in a scope like this, here x does not fall out of scope. So if we, here we also have SDC out and do x, and this will still work. So x does not fall out of scope, and oh wait, I messed something up. Why is this a problem? One second. Okay, one second. I'm not entirely sure what I did wrong here. I'll be right back. Okay, so I realized I did a mistake. So I will take this from the scratch. Um, so I want to declare a pointer, for example x, and then inside the scope, now for, for example inside the scope to demonstrate what I want to say, I can do x equals with new integer. And now this integer will be created on the heap because of a new keyword. And that means that for example I can set the value of that x points to, to let's say 5, and then I can access this 5 
outside the scope. So it won't be deleted here. So I can do SEDC out FX and do it straight out to 5. As you can see. Then the, the idea is that now I, I can basically do this with any data type. So I can do, for example, a double double y and I can double y equals with new double double and what I can do is put some open and close brackets and write in here the value for example 4.7 wait 4.7 and this will basically initialize it, the, the double immediately 4.7 so if I do SDC out and the value of i, the value at y.2, it will give me 4.7. As you can see, if you put a new line here, and the new line here. Okay. Okay. And when I want to delete this, so if I want to free up the memory, if I don't need them anymore, I can use the delete keyword. That would be delete, and now I can delete x, and I can delete y. And now they are basically deleted, the memory is freed up, and I can use it for something else. And one, one more thing, if I want to create a C-style array, for example, an array of integers in array, and let's say it was with new int, I have to put the open and close square brackets, let's say it will hold four elements and I can do for example I don't know 3, 6, 2, 8 and now if you can see here I can access its elements, so array of 3 should, should output 2, and oh sorry 8 so if we have to put work uh, one second, what did I mess up again? Okay, here 8, as you can see. And now if I want to delete this array, I, I just have to delete and with open and close square brackets. Array. And this will delete the array from the heap. This works fine. And it is that you want to delete the memory, because if you don't free up the memory, then you are going to run into something called a memory leak. And what is a memory leak? Well, basically, if you don't free up the memory using the delete keyword, that memory is going to be used like for the whole time that your program runs. And it may not seem like a big deal for small programs because that memory will get freed up at the end of the program. So it may not seem much like much to, for example, leak an array of integers of an array of four integers. This would be. 16 bytes. And it may not seem like a big deal and it will get deleted anyway when the program ends. However, in bigger applications and in, big, in bigger problems, programs, these, uh, these memory leaks could really mess stuff up and you could leak uh, tens of gigabytes of data just because you forgot, you forgot to delete something. So remember this. You must delete everything that you declare on, on the sec. And this will bring us to the next topic that are going to be smart points. So smart pointers basically clean the clean the memory allocated on the heap, so that use, so the programmer doesn't have to do so. Basically, if you have a smart pointer that, that points to a variable, so to a value on the heap, then you don't actually have to, to delete the value. You don't have to, to delete it because the smart pointer is going to do it for you. And so smart pointers are they're declared in the memory header. So include the memory. And there are four types of smart pointers. There is the unique pointer, std unique pointer. There's std shared pointer. There's std weak pointer and then there is sd out pointer we are not going to talk 
about the auto pointer because it's what the ATD is customizing and it's not recommended to be used if you're running other versions. So it is in C17. So you are not going to talk about it. And so there are three types of pointers, of smart pointers that are interesting to us. There is the, the unique pointer that basically only one unique pointer can point to a memory address. There can be more. And there's a share, the shared pointer that basically there can be more shared pointers pointing to the same mem memory address. And then there's the weak pointer that we are going to discuss a little bit later. So basically, we can declare a unique pointer by doing std unique unique pointer. For example, of type let's say int, we are declaring the pointer to an integer p1, and we are going to make in parentheses new, and this will basically declare a new integer on the heap, and we can do p1 equals with six for example. So we set the value at the p1 memory address set to six, and we can do sdcl p1. Um, now, a better way to actually declare a, a, a smart pointer in general is instead of using this here, is to use, for example, unique pointer of int p2 equals with std make unique, unique of int like this. So this it, it does the same thing basically, but it is preferred to use this because it, it's more error prone and just use this. <laughs> use. And here in the parentheses, we, for example, we can write 6. So it says, and test this out p2. This should be 6 as well. Correctly, it will work. That would be great. Uh, just give it a bit of time for your problems. <laughs> um, I messed something up somewhere. One second. Russian. Wait, what? Uh, no, it works. Okay, so it was just repeating a few issues. <laughs> so, as you can see, this one is points to a value of 6 as well. However, so we, we cannot, uh, the only one unique pointer can point to one memory address. So, for example, we can do an std unique, unique pointer of int. We can do p3 equals with p2. This will not work and it will give us an error, as you can see. Unique, unique pointer. Uh, uh, it just it doesn't work because it is unique. So instead, we, what we can do is we can move the address that p2 points to to p3 using the so we can do std move p2. And now we basically moved p2 to p3 and p2 got invalidated, so we can't use p2 anymore. So if I try to do, for example, p3 equals p3, this will give an error. Um, you can see segmentation fault. However, we can now do p3 equals p3, and we can do SDCL, the value at p3. So, like this. And so this is basically it with unique pointers. Now we are going to move to shared pointers. So they have the same syntax, std shared, std shared pointer, pointer of int, now let's say p1 equals with std make shared int, and let's say 7. And the idea with shared pointers is that they basically have an internal counter. That that internal counter is going to count how many shared pointers are pointing to the same value. 
So right now the counter is 1. Counter 1 because there's one pointer pointing to this integer. And for example, you can make a D share pointer. You can make another one. Enter to an in P2 equals with P1. And now the counter is going to go to two. counter 2. And so this should work. Okay, and the idea is the object is only going to get deleted when the counter reaches 0. So when all the pointers fall out of scope. So for example, if here there would be a, a scope, uh, and this pointer would be declared in this scope, here p2 falls out of scope, of scope, but the value it points to is not deleted. And this is because p1 still exists and it still points to this integer. So now we are going to have counter being 1. And we can do as to this out p1 if you want. And this is still going to give us the value of 7. And now when the program ends and p1 falls out of scope as well, P1 scope. So basically, the counter reaches zero here. You know, so that integer is going to be deleted from the heap. So, so the value is basically going to get deleted here, and that is why that's the difference between shared pointers and unique pointer. And there is also the weak pointer. So the weak pointer is, is like a shared pointer. However, it does not matter to us the discounter. So basically you have to declare a weak pointer. Let me just delete most of this. And okay. So you, you can basically declare a weak pointer. Like let it be weak pointer. Of int, let's name it weak pointer one equals weak pointer one. So this will work, as you can see. However, if you want to access the value that is stored in this weak pointer, you have to temporarily convert to a strong pointer to a shared pointer. Sorry, that is also called a strong pointer, like a strong reference, but that that doesn't matter that much right now. So. Basically, if you can, for example, see the value that is stored here, we have to dereference it and use weak pointer one dot block. And this will basically temporarily make this weak pointer into a shared pointer, so we can access its value. Uh, like this. As you can see now, the value is 7. However, if you, if you try to just do as it is see out with pointer 1, it is not going to work because it, it is not uh, changed, it is not converted to a shared pointer yet here. And basically, the idea is that the weak pointer checks if there are any shared pointers and if the value still exists. However, if, if the shared pointer gets deleted, before, then this, the weak pointer that doesn't matter to our method. Now, I don't know that, I don't know how to explain them very well because I never really use them, so I'm going to link in, in the lecture notes some links and you'll probably, and you will be able to check them out. Uh, and if you have any questions ask in the live stream chat or in the Discord server, so now I, I'm going to get the next topic. So now I'm going to talk about bitwise operators. So bitwise operators are basically some operators that uh, manipulate the binary representation of numbers. So what do I mean by this? Let, let me give you one example. So if we have, for example, 
an integer that that will be a equals to thirteen. Thirteen in the in the in base two in binary is represented as zero 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 and um, one one zero one. So th this is thirteen in binary. And if if I have for example a different integer, if I have b equals with seven. 7 in binary is 0, 0, 0, 0, wait, uh, 0, 1, 1, 1. Then I, I can perform some operations on on this, on these things, on the, on the bits of the numbers. Do for example, int c equals with a, and this is the binary or operator, b, or operator. And what is C going to be equal with? Well, basically we are going to get if any of the bits that are on the same position from the first bit, the second bit, third bit, if if any of the of these bits are one, the, the output is going to be one. So basically C is going to be equal to um one. Wait, C is going to be equal and here I will write the numbers again. So this is 13 and this is going to be 7. And now the result is going to be 0 and 0. There's no ones in here. So the output is going to be 0. 0 and 0 are the same. This like this part is going to be 0. And then here 1 and 0. There is one 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 bit that is 1. So it's going to be 1. Here both of the bits are, are 1, so the, the result is going to be 1. Here the, the bit from the second number is 1, so the output is going to be 1. And here both bits are 1, so the output is going to be 1. So that means that C is equal with 1, 1, 1, 1. That, that in binary means 15. Like this. Yes. And that is what the OR operator does. And then there are five more operators. There is let me just put them in order. So, our operator, that is this one. Then there is the n operator, that is this one. So, if we have in a equals with 13 and let's see, and b equals in b equals with 7, we have the same binary representation. And then in C equals with A and and B. Here we will have the same thing. One second. However, if both bits are one, then the output is going to be one. So here both bits are zero, so it's zero, 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 zero. And then here one bit is one. However, the second one is zero, so the output is going to be zero. Here both bits are 1, so the output is going to be 1. Here only one bit is 1, so the output is going to be 0. And here both bits are 1, so the output is going to be 1. So now basically C here is equal with... Okay, so C is equal with um, 101 in binary, that is this this is 4 and 5, 101 is 5 in binary. I hope this makes sense until now, if it doesn't ask, ask in the chat. Okay, I'm going to go to the next operators. This is going to be the XOR operator. So, XOR operator. And this. And what does the XOR operator do? What does the XOR operator do? So, if you have int a equals with 13 and int b equals with 7, int c equals with a, xor with b, basically the same binary representation, that we will have if one of the bits is 1 and one of the, and the other one is 0, then the other is going to be 1. Otherwise, if both are 0 or both are 1, then the output is going to be 0. 
So here both are zero, so the output is going to be zero. Both are zero, the output is going to be zero, 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 zero. Here one of them is one and one of them is zero, so the output is going to be one. Here both of them are one, so the output is going to be zero. Here only one of them is one, so the output is going to be one. And here both, both of the bits are one, so the output is going to be zero. So that means that C is going to be equal to 10, because this is 1010 is, is 10 in binary. Okay, and now we are going to get to the not operator, the not operator, and this is with tilde. So what does the not, not operator do? Uh, here I'm going to, to declare short integer, because it's going to be easier. Short int, um, let's name it a equals with 13. And I'll make this unsigned for now, because it is going to be a bit easier to explain. Unsigned short int, or int here is optional, it's the same thing. So this is going to be used 2 bytes of data. So it's basically going to use 16 bits. So it will, it will be represented as the first 8 bits are going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And the second 8 bits are going to be 0, 0, 0, 0, and as I said before, 1, 1, 0, 1. 1, 1, 0, 1. So I'll put this in a line. Mm -hmm. and like this. So this is the first byte and this is the second byte. A byte is 8 bits, by the way. And now with the not operator, what it's going to do is it's going to flip all the bits. So a 0 is going to become 1 and one, the 1s are going to become zeros. I can do uh, unsigned short b equals with not a and what is this going to mean it's going to mean that b is going to have one 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 because it basically flips the bits from zero to one from one to zero one 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 and here the one is going to get to zero is going to become zero this one is going to become zero the zero is going to become one and the one is going to become zero so that means that b is going to be equal to and this number in binaries is equal to if i'm not mistaken 65,522 and i used unsigned because with signed integers so if I would have short c equals with not a, this is going, this is because in the way that the the numbers are represented in the computer memory, here c is going to be equal with minus 14, but I'm not going to get into this right now because it's a bit more complicated and not that necessary to know. But so you just have to know that the not operator basically bits on all the bits from 0 to 1 and from 1 to 0. And now I'm going to get to the last two operators that are very similar, the left shift and the, and the right shift operators. So I'm going to have the left shift operator, left shift operator, that is the, like this, like is the same as the C out operator. When you write C out, but it's, it's, it's different, <laughs> it does something else. So, this basically shifts all the bits to the left by a number. So, for example, if I have int a equals with 13, and I have int b equals with 2, int c equals with a and left shift by b. What does this mean? Uh, it means that the bits of A get shifted to the left, basically, to the left by B places, by B uh, 
uh, places. I'm going to explain it in the example. So A is 13 is 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And after they get shifted to the left, so basically this one is going to go here because it's 1, 2, and B is 2. So we're going to have 0, 0, and 1. This one is going to get 1, 2, shifted over here. This 0 is going to be after 0, and this one is going to be after 1. And, and the next bits are going to be 0 as well, because uh, basically just it, it got shifted to the left. I, I don't know how to explain this better. And the idea is that now C is going to be equal with this number in, bi in binary is equal to... Let me just get the ca calculator up. <laughs> One second. So, yeah, so this number is equal to 64. That, if, if you are... If you know um, that you are going to see 64 is actually 13 times 4 or it's actually 13 times 2 to the power of 2. So here we are using the math mathematical use for this. So two, 13 times 2 to the power of 2. So what does this mean? This means that when you left shift um, a number by x bytes, so if I do they have an a equals to, I don't know, a number, let's say x. If I do int b, if I also have int, int if I do a, let's shift it by y, so x and y are some, are some numbers that we know from before. This means that a is actually, like, this value is going to be equal to a times x, x a times 2 to the power of y. So let me give you an example. If we have 3 and left shift by 4, this is the same thing as 3 times 2 to the power of 4. So the same thing as 3 times 16 and this is equal to 48. <laughs> if, I, if I didn't mess up anything up. And this is a pretty cool trick because it, it takes late, less time for the computer to actually ca calculate that. So you, you may want to use it anytime you can. It's not necessary. And now I, I'm going to also talk about the right shift operator. That's basically the opposite of the left shift operator. Operator that is like this. And it basically shifts all the bits to the right by n places. So at int a equals to 13 and int b equals to 2. Or actually, let me get uh, a different number. Like, uh, I will get 48. Okay? So 48 in binary is actually 1 second, so I don't mess anything up. 48 is. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Let me say this out a bit. And when I left shift it, I mean not when I right shift it, so if I go C equals with, with A and right shift B, this basically means that I'm going to move these bits to the right by two places. I'm going to have 0, 0. This 0 gets moved here. So 0, this 0 gets moved here, with 0. This one gets moved to places, so it's going to be 1. This one gets moved to places here, so it's going to be 1. And then this 0 is moved here, so it's going to be 0. And this 0 is moved here, so it's going to be 0 as well. And this number is, is equal to, so this is the same as, so C is now equal to, um, if I'm not mistaken, to 12, and as you can see, it's 12 is actually 12 is equal to 48 divided by 2 to the power of 2, so 48 divided by 4. So that means that the right shift operator is the same as a division, but so if you have um, int a equals with x, and if you 
right shift A by y, bit, y bits and this is going to be the same as A divided by 2 to the power of Y so as you can see it's the, it's the same as in multiplication and for example if, if we have um, the number 14 and we right shift it by 2 this is going to get be the same output as 14 divided by 2 by 2 to the power of 2 that is 14 divided by 4 that in programming without um, is going to 14 divided by 4 is going to be 3 and the reminder is going to be 2 however we don't we don't store the reminder in C++ um, because these are integers so basically the, this is going to be 3 and it's, like, it's the same as here and one quick note if we have a number for example 0 0 0 0 1 1 1 0 1 and if we want to left shift this by 2 for example the these bits are just going to be lost so the result is going to be 0 0 0 we left shift 1 by we right shift 1 by 2 places so it's going to be 0 0 1 1 and this one is getting lost it's not going to matter here and so yeah, that's just something to keep in mind. So I hope you understood this. I I don't know if I made myself very clear. If you have any questions, I ask them in the chat. And I find them pretty easy once you get the hang of it of them. So yeah. So now I'm going to talk about the type that and the using keywords. There are two keywords: type that and using. They are both related to how, how you how you basically write your, pro your program so first of all I'm going to talk about typedef typedef basically sets a, an alias or you could say a nickname to a name of a data type for example or other, other stuff so for example I can do typedef and one second so if I have for example, if I want to use an unsigned long long, but I want to use it many, many times, I want to use unsigned long long x, unsigned long long y, etc. etc. But I, I don't want to type unsigned long long each time. So what I can do is I, I can say that unsigned long long is going to be the same as, for example, ULL. This is easier to type. It's basically going to, to replace any ULL that it sees in here for example these are going to be unsigned long longs because that's what I I said here so I can do for example x equals with 6 and y equals with 2 I can make this cell x and y and this, this is basically what the, the type that basically sets a sets an alias or a nickname if you want. And now I'm going to talk about the using keyword that has is similar in most cases. So first of all you can use it for the same in the same way that you use type that. So you can do for example using ULL equals with unsigned long long. So this does the exact same thing. If I comment this out, and I only let, and I only let this using URL equals with unsigned long long, this will work perfectly, as you can see. So this is the first way you can use it. So set an alias as well. And the second way you can use this is to, to say that you are using a namespace throughout your, your program or your scope. Or, you can do it using namespace and FTD, for example. And what does this mean? This means that now I don't have, you know how I always write FTD, CL, and FTD, C, and let's say, I don't know, FTD, unique pointer, because we have that lecture, that lecture before, that topic before. <laughs> Now, if I'm using this namespace std, I don't have to write this std 
before everything. I can just let them like this. For example, I can now just see out hello and line. I can you can include the memory header. So memory I can create a unique folder. My family P1. I if I want I can include LA and I can use instead of std array I can use just array in and suits array so I think you got the point basically this using namespace std tells the compiler that everything has std behind it usually you don't have to put it there anymore however this is not necessarily recommended to do because the, the purpose of the namespace is to differentiate, differentiate stuff. For example, if I were to create, I don't know, if I were to create a class that's called array, I can do this because array is already something in the std namespace, and that, that is why you shouldn't use you shouldn't use using namespace std. And I, I hope you understood this. I might. It's fairly simple. It basically helps you to write to write less less code, but as I said this is not a good practice. So it's bad practice. Don't do it. And if you want I'm going you I'm going to explain the in the comment section or in the announcement or something why this is this is not good to do, this why this is a bad, bad practice. But for now, this was it. This is the end of the lecture, and I really hope that you understood. If you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Now, I would like to ask you for some feedback, because this was my first lecture ever, and I know I messed up some, in some places, but <laughs> I'm looking forward to see what you guys thought, and, and how I can improve my lectures the next time. Now, I'm going to... Say goodbye and hopefully I'll see you the next time.